Now let's assume that we want to do a confirmatory factor analysis on these five items. How do we do that? Well, basically the idea is uh, pretty straightforward. Let me re redraw these items here. Uh, so item one, item two, or measurement, measurement one, two, three, four, and five over time. In a confirmatory factor analysis model, we assume that uh, there is a latent variable or latent trait, if you will, that causes the variance in these items. And the influence of the latent variable, I call this the latent variable, uh, the, the influence of this latent variable on the items is represented by these arrows. Okay, so uh, each of uh, the, the latent variable itself uh, can be referred to as uh, eta, and the v it also has a variance. So it's represented by this two-headed uh, arrow. Again, a variance, as I mentioned above, is represented by a psi. In addition to that, each of these items, as I have discussed in another video, have got residuals attached to them. So they are represented by, again, arrows. And in Amos, you also have a very small um, circle like that, which represents the amount of error. And basically, the amount of error is a part of the variance in the items that cannot be explained by the latent variables that are otherwise considered to be the cause of the items. All right, so each of these items also have means. So there is a mean for item one or measurement time one. Let's remember that within this context, I'm assuming that this item here uh, is basically a uh, the same measurement across t in time zero. This item is measurement time one, time two, uh, three, and time four. This is what I mean exactly. What I'm doing in this part is to show you how we can rep how we can use structural equation modeling or confirmatory factor analysis, if you will, to do a uh, latent growth curve model analysis. Okay, so let me go back to the shape itself and see what we can get out of it. In uh, stru uh, structural equation modeling or CFA analysis, if you remember, we only fixed one of these parameters to one and estimated the rest of them. And here is where the differences between uh, latent growth curve model and confirmatory factor analysis starts. So what are those differences? Let me represent the differences with uh, red color. Uh, one is that we have to fix all of these regression coefficients because that's really not what we want to investigate within the framework of uh, latent growth curve models. As I mentioned above, we only need to know intercepts and slopes and the covariances between intercepts and slopes in basic models, which are also known as uh, unconditional models. And then if you find out, what, uh, if you find that there is significant variance in either the intercept or the slope, then you can carry on further follow-up analysis to see what causes that variance. That's really all, all we want to do within this framework. And therefore, we have to fix this to, for example, one or zero, if you will. One, uh, so I just use one, which is more uh, standard in many textbooks they use one, so, and one. So really, the beta coefficients or the regression weights of these items do not matter at all uh, within the framework of uh, structural equation modeling in Amos. So uh, let's say that yellow highlight means just forget about them. The other thing that we need to fix to zero is basically the means, the mean scores. So I got to fix it to zero of the items as well. So what do we want to, want to look into? We want to look into the variance and mean 
of the residuals and I, I can also add this basically number four the variance and mean of residuals in the confirmatory fact analysis. This is like an advantage of using confirmatory fact analysis in, uh, in uh, latent growth curve modeling. What else do we want to know about this? Uh, well, the, the very important factor is that this variable here represents our intercept. In other words, we know that there is an intercept in our data but within this framework, we assume that this intercept is not ob observable. Uh, so we want to examine uh, how that unobservable intercept behaves. In other words, what is the variance and also, of course, the mean of that intercept, which is uh, represented by mu. So psi sub alpha and mu sub alpha are the two parameters that we want to investigate when it comes to the intercepts. Another thing we need to remember is that if we only uh, include um, intercept in our uh, model and do not incorporate the slope in this model, what we're assuming is that basically, here I want to represent it here in this graph, is that students or the participants in this analysis basically do not change over time. In other words, there is no slope. So everybody is perpendicular to the x-axis and people are quite parallel and the pattern is a very sort of flat pattern. If you compare it with the pattern here, which is not flat, uh, because uh, we have allowed that slope to also play a role. So this does not really present the reality of the data. What should we do? In this case we need to include a slope and the slope is also represented by another latent variable. We also call this eta and uh, so this is eta alpha, this is eta sub beta and there is also variance for this variable and that variance is as I mentioned above, is psi sub beta. Not only that, but also there is a mean mu sub beta. So we want to investigate uh, how the variance and mu behave as well in the slope. The slope, therefore, uh, predicts variation in those measurements in this way. And finally, this one. Okay. Uh, another difference that I would like to highlight here with, again, confirmative fact analysis is that, is that instead of fixing all of uh, one of these, uh, uh, let's say, regression paths to one, what we need to superimpose on this pattern is the pattern or the trend that we want to examine. For example, I assume that there will be a linear uh, a growth of pattern uh, generally speaking, in my uh, test takers or my participants. Therefore, I'll fix the first one to one, the second uh, regression coefficient to two, the third one to three, uh, four, and five. What this means is that we're actually uh, moving over time, and as we're moving over time, the rate of the growth is more or less the same. Or you could start from zero, one, two, three, and four. It doesn't really matter. The growth will be more or less the same. Next, we also have this covariance between the slope and the intercept parameters. And we need to take that into account. And therefore, I'm going to include that in this model uh, and represent it by two-headed arrows. This is our covariance, which is notated as uh, psi alpha beta. Okay. Um, there are some other um, notes uh, I just very quickly touch on and um,
then I'll explain how to do the analysis in Amos, perhaps in a separate video, really, because this video is becoming quite long. This uh, model is a basic model of growth and is known as unconditional growth model. Why do we call this unconditional growth model? Because we're not conditioning the variance or the mean in these two uh, latent, uh, latent variables, that's the intercept and the slope, and this one and this one, we, we're not conditioning them on any other variables. Now let's say we find that there is significant variance here and significant variance for the intercept. Also there's a significant covariance between uh, the uh, slope and the intercept. What should we do? Well, that's where the idea of conditional, conditional growth model comes into the picture. What we should do is to take into account the effect of external variables. For example, um, some time invariant, an example is time in uh, sorry about the typo um, okay so time in variant of variables such as gender that doesn't change over time or SES or anything else that you assume would have an effect on the on the slope or the intercept of these uh, uh, of the data that we have uh, collected, in order to represent time as as an example, or also SES as another example, what I think what what I suggest we should do is to first of all include an an error of um, measurement or a disturbance here. Let's call that disturbance one, and another one here disturbance two. The reason is, I've explained this in the confirmatory fact analysis and structural equation modeling videos. Whenever a variable becomes an endogenous variable, which is actually a dependent variable, then it, there will be some error of measurement that cannot be explained by the exogenous variables that have an impact on them. So in this case, we have these two exogenous variables, one being gender, the gender, and the other one being SES, this one. So the exogenous variable exerts an influence over our slope as well as over the intercept. In the same way, the second exogenous variable exerts an influence over the intercept and the slope. And we should also covary these two. Why do we covary this? It's actually important to covary them for two reasons. One is for fit fit reasons. It it will give us a better fit. But the more important reason is that by covaring these two exogenous variables, what we assume is what we're doing basically is to control for the effect of these two on these paths. For example, uh, the the path here, let's call it path one, is not any more affected by SES and it, it's only and only uh, it, uh, it only and only represents the effect of gender on the slope. In the same way the second path only represents the effect of gender on the intercept and paths three and four in the same way represent the effects of SES on the slope and intercept without uh, uh, receiving any influence from gender itself. So this is how we control for the effect of these exogenous variables on each other's path. This becomes a conditional growth model. Uh, oh, so one last thing that I would like to add is that some of the variables that we could uh, include in the conditional growth model are not necessarily time invariant. They vary over time and as a result they're called, so this is one type, type 2 will be time variant. Now for time variant uh, factors, it's pretty difficult for me to 
find an example in in applied linguistics or language assessment. But let's say um, something like a change of the educational system over time. Um, let uh, so we can actually create a binary variable. Um, so change of let's just simplify it to school. Some students have gone to a different school. So those students who have gone to to different school uh, during their schooling, you can call you can uh, give uh, represent them by one, and those who stayed in their schools you can represent them by zero. And so for for the first time, one two three four five or zero one two three all the way through five through four um, for, for the first time uh, of measurement uh, we can look into the effects of this change of school on this variable so it's going to be like this so let's get let's call it s in the same way s can be put into the analysis for the second uh, time point of measurement s will also have some effects on three probably s also has some effects here s sorry and finally s has some effects here and we want to figure out whether these uh, s or change of school variables can predict uh, the performance of students over time that's why we need to include them five times so this is basically more or less everything we need to know about uh, latent growth curve modeling and following this we will fall back on the usual or the conventional uh, language that is used in structural equation modeling so we need to look into fit statistics to figure out if the model that we have created fits the data well or not and only after this can we move on to the investigation of the variance and the mean and uh, the covariances uh, this is for the alpha and beta and the covariances of alpha and beta in this in this case we also would need to figure out whether gender affects the slope and the intercept and as a result we need to understand how much that effect is by looking at the regression coefficient coefficient of gender on the one hand and the regression coefficients of SES on the other hand. So that brings me to the end of this video. I hope you find it useful. Please stay tuned in. In the next video I will demonstrate how to operational, operationalize all these ideas within Amos and how to run a useful uh, a latent growth curve model analysis. Have a good day.